could have all the products in the world, but if you only have a thousand dollars to spend every month, those really, really good products, you're still going to be restrained. You're going to have, you know what I'm saying? You're going to be on a leash. But the cool thing is, and that we see this now nowadays, modern day is when you combine with a newer seller product information, as well as capital, well, that's where we see the $20,000 or the $5,000 a month, the 30 and then the 110, yep. right? Because the best thing about this business is that the ceiling is really as high as your capital can take you. E-commerce is the greatest business opportunity of our generation. What's up, people? Welcome back to another episode of the Ecom Unlimited podcast. Today, we've got our boy Garrett, aka All Out Amazon. We were just down in Miami for the Miami Sellers Conference, and we are back up in not so warm PA. <laughs> I think there was a 40 to 50 degree temperature difference <laughs> from flying back from Miami. So we're all kind of adjusting cranky windy, to that. Windy too. And windy to make too. Matters yeah. Even worse. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, boys, how are we doing? Why don't we do like a, a quick two minute MSC recap for the people who weren't able to go and then we'll dive into your story. Man, stuff like that never gets old. Like just getting together in the community, right? Because the cool thing is, Obviously, I've been going to that event for, I think, four years now. But there's always new people that kind of get engraved into the community. So you're always meeting new people that you've interacted with, whether it be on the Twitter timeline, Instagram, YouTube, whatever the case may be, uh, for potentially months and or years. All right, so it's always kind of refreshing, energizing to meet the people that you've been interacting with and obviously rekindle uh, people that you've already met, right? So it, it, it's always cool. It's always energizing. It's always interesting to see so many different people come together all with sort of like a common goal which is pretty cool um getting a lot of, you know building wealth on amazon is the kind of common denominator across everyone so it, it just never gets old 100 percent. yeah josh what's your perspective yeah i mean just so cool like meeting the people you already know and meeting new people i remember like me and kaj just walking into the venue like we were running already running late trying to get a seat and i ended up sitting next to like the guy that I've been like DMing for like three months for a while and it would just happen to be so random, but I knew him because of his profile picture. And so it was just really cool to like one meet him in person, but then just bump into him like that. And he knew me and I knew him right away. And it, it just, it just wasn't no like awkward highs. Like, who are you? How are you? Kind of like you already knew each other and you can just kind of go from there. So yeah, it was an incredible event. I always have fun every year. 100%. Yep. Same here. It's always good to be able to meet people in person that you've been talking with online for a while. And then also, you know, just pick up new things from what the speakers are saying as well. So yeah, great time. Definitely recommend people go next year as well. Okay. Mr. Garrett. So yes, sir. all out Amazon, five box bandits, the, the keep a product finder guy, people already know you, <laughs> but let's, let's take it back to the beginning. How did you get started? selling products online when did you get started just give us the story man it's been a wild ride uh probably four or five years ago i don't know it was in the middle of COVID when everyone was kind of locked down no one can really go anywhere do much and at the time i had just graduated from college i graduated in 2018 math and finance double major working a standard nine to five corporate job remote Right, so when COVID came, nothing really changed, right? I was still doing my nine to five thing. On the weekends, I was serving at a restaurant and that restaurant had just gotten shut down. Right, so this is probably February, March-ish, right? I spent a year doing corporate, restaurant on the weekends, life was good, right? Restaurant got shut down, all of a sudden I had all this free time on the weekends, right? And I'm not necessarily the type of guy that's like gonna sit around, watch a bunch of TV, Netflix, YouTube, whatever the case may be, and just kind of like, watch the hours pass. So I knew pretty quickly I needed to find something, right? A couple weekends went by, COVID obviously wasn't going anywhere. Um, so naturally kind of my attention just went to, right? Phones, YouTube, Instagram, just kind of scrolling, kind of finding something to do, right? I knew this sort of COVID thing was, it was probably gonna blast a while, so I needed something. I don't know how or what sort of video, but at some point I stumbled across Reezy Resales Marshalls, uh, not Marshalls, like book scanning stuff, right? Looks pretty interesting. Ironically enough, at that time, I'm pretty sure a lot of the 
goodwills were still open. If not, um, at least Facebook Marketplace, a ton of people were listing books. So mm -hmm. that was something that was easily applicable to kind of my present life at that point in time, right? Piqued my interest, kind of got into the weeds of of Scout IQ and you know how this whole process works, buying a book for 50 cents, selling it for $12, that sort of thing. All right, so I started scavengering Facebook Marketplace, did a bunch of like bulk book pickups, went to a couple good mar marshals, or not marshals, I keep saying marshals, goodwills, and just started kind of getting into that space. No idea what I was doing, but really just kind of wanted to validate something that it worked, right? And so I was probably the rare case that I didn't really have any business background before Amazon. I wasn't the high school or middle schooler that was flipping candy bars or anything like that. I had no no business background. My parents were as corporate as could be, super reserved. So this was all like pretty new, right? So I kind of wanted to just experiment and just like see what was up, right? See what was going on. Um, got a ton of books for free off Facebook, listed them all, sent them in. The first shipment took like seven hours. It was miserable. But in a couple of days, right? Maybe a couple of weeks or whatever the case may be, yeah, a couple books sold, right? And at that point, that was the validation I needed. Now, at the time, again, I was working a nine to five job. I had I had a good income. I would you know stored away a lot of cash. So I wasn't necessarily looking for a side hustle. I was looking for something more legitimate. You know, a couple hundred dollars wasn't going to move the needle much for me. Um, I was looking for something that I could add, you know, four, five, six, eight, ten thousand dollars to my monthly income because that was something that was really going to kind of like pique my interest. It had to be something that was going to move the needle. And for me at the time, books wasn't going to be that, right? Just based on accessibility, right? Ease of purchase, right? I couldn't on demand spend my five thousand, ten thousand dollars, whatever the case may be, to make that five hundred, a hundred or a thousand dollars back. So I needed something more. Went back into the dungeon, went back into like the weeds of the the depths of in social media. That's when I found online arbitrage, right? And so you kind of see this iterative process. Yep. Found online arbitrage. Um, and it was like, and this was that was sort of like the magical sauce that I was looking for. Um, where I could start to spend more and access all this data and and make these sort of analytical decisions that you kind of see me talking about on social media. This was at the beginning of it all, right? I knew this was sort of like the thing that I was looking for, but um, I knew online arbitrage was the goal, but again, RA was sort of like that next step for me. I was in Southeastern PA, so the outlets were, you know, all around, obviously, Kaju, or both of you guys know, yep, um, yep. you know, Philly outlets, the La Lancaster outlets, Tons of Dick Sporting Goods, Marshalls, TJ Maxx. I don't necessarily know the timeline of this, but I remember like that next step, knowing online arbitrage with the goal. I was just driving after I clocked out nine to five. I would do my rounds. I would Dick Sporting Goods. I would hit like three or four, hit the outlets. I was out from like like five to like eleven Monday through Friday every single night during the week. Grinding. And then Saturdays, I would spend like pretty much the entire day doing my rounds, hit up both outlets. That was probably two, three, four months. And it was working really well. Obviously, at the time, it's a completely different landscape. There was just money sitting everywhere. Like everywhere you touched um, was, was, was profitable. And so that was awesome. But I was just I was just beating myself to the ground. Obviously, I was working a bunch, 60, 70, 80 hours a week at the time. No prep center, just picking up stuff anywhere I possibly could. Uh, of course, doing a lot of the marathons that I still do now then, I was just completely drained. And so that's where I was like, all right, this is all working. This is super sweet, but I guess I, I need to be more efficient. I knew the RA model in my current standards of life wasn't necessarily going to be the answer. Again, going now, going back to the online arbitrage piece with some more capital in the game, with some more cash in the game, a bit more of a clue in terms of like what made a good product, sort of like that authent authentication of, of what a good keeper graph looks like and what a one doesn't look like and what sort of I'm looking for and what I'm not looking for. All this stuff sort of made sense. But at the time, again, this is three, four years ago, it was a lot of trial by error. I couldn't go to YouTube and understand and really dissect in 30 minutes what a keeper graph was that I was looking for, I was supposed to not. So this took four or five months of trial by error of just like actually seeing the data, buying something, it worked out, it didn't work out, going back to the drawing board, reevaluating where I was at that decision and just continuing to construct sort of an ideology of what I was looking for. And so RA for me at the time, was really a, an, a really quick and efficient iterative process to develop a database of, of how I wanted to understand product research, how I wanted to understand analytics, and how I really wanted to build the business, right? That's what RA was for me, more so than just turning a dollar into a dollar fifty. It was my way of, 
of really learning the weeds of, of how to make an analytical decision accurately and efficiently and something that converted over time. So now that I built that up, I was able to apply that to an online arbitrage business that took off pretty quickly, right? At that time, as I started to scale up into OA, um, that's kind of where I met Miles online and the rest is kind of history. I, that part is kind of like well-documented in terms of like linking up with Miles and now we met Danny and now the three of us will be on Zoom calls, on FaceTime, six hours a day, four hours a day, just kind of just having fun, um, building this thing up, buying a lot of stuff. Um, and I mean, that's really how it kind of built. Did online arbitrage for a year or so, started to then get into wholesale. This is probably end of 22, early 23. Um, and then here we are, mid, or what are we in, Q4 of 2024, and uh, life is good, man. No complaints. Been a bunch of cool people on the way. Obviously, these two goofballs on the screen right here. Um, <laughs> yeah, no regrets. Everything's been awesome. Now, what kind of revenue were you kind of doing with RA? Now, with going to the stores and stuff, it's kind of, I know it's challenging to, you know, make that massive amount of um, kind of profit with, like, time and driving and lines and packing and shipping and all that kind of stuff. Talk to us a little about a little bit about what your revenue was like over those few either months or years. I don't, I'm not sure how how long you actually did RA for. Yeah. So was, again, it was about probably five to six months. And I would say it was anywhere between probably 40 and 50,000 at that time. Um, main thing being product acquisition. And I, I, I really kind of got it from both ends, capital and product acquisition, right? So I remember in the D Nike outlet, several different case scenarios where I was like, I'm, I'm doing the math in my head. I was like, all right, I got like $1,500 of spend right here. It's looking at my credit card. I only have 12. Oh, shoot. I got to transfer some over, pay down the credit card 300 to be able to actually be able to buy what's in my cart. So I was like kind of just really flying by the seat of my pants for most of it. Um, and uh, just kind of like aggressively building a as fast as possible because um, that's just kind of how I do a lot of things. Uh, that's that that uh forceful forceful growth you know yeah that's really great yeah just just keep pounding the wall until it breaks no need to use the door <laughs> i mean that's yeah. it by whatever means necessary i'll take the mallet i'll take the hammer i'll take <laughs> kaj's big muscles over there i'll take anything i can get <laughs> that's great now what kind of business model are you doing right now now i know you're you talked kind of you went up to like your online arbitrage when you went miles um Talk to us a little bit about the uh, OA early years and maybe your next steps into wholesale and how that kind of how that transition worked. Yeah, so I've been doing wholesale for the past call it year and a half at some, at some pretty good scale. Um, as of recently, over the past two, you know, probably like three or four months, I've actually started to kind of distribute some of my time and attention and, and money to so like a new distribution model, right? So. For me, as my audience grows, as my network grows, as the the trust that I have in the community grows, in my mind, one of the best ways to monetize all of that is to provide tangible, put, put dollars in people's pockets, right? Not from like a content course perspective, but like an actual product acquisition, acquisition perspective, right? So like I've yeah. just been developing a ton of supply chain connections and all those sorts of things over the course of the past year or two. Um, and I know the people that want that, right? So for me, building up the past two, three months to kind of the, this new distribution model, I think is something that is needed in the community, something that isn't as prevalent as probably people could use. So it's a lot of just connecting both ends of the supply chain, the Amazon seller who wants products, the, you know, the suppliers and brands and things that are, are willing to provide their products and kind of like aggregating the two. Um, so it's, it's wholesale, but less wholesale and more kind of distribution over the past year or like four months. That's really interesting. That's very cool. Now, with that, is it like, is there like a certain time? Is the timing pretty rough with those? Because I know suppliers sometimes, you know, they get in products, they're trying to get out products. Do you find any issues with any sort of like the timing of it all? Or are they pretty like, they kind of understand like, hey, if you can get everything in like, you know, two, three weeks, like we have product on hand, like, yeah, so it depends who I'm working with, right? So most of it is, um, or most of it in the past has been kind of like domestic distribution. So a lot of that is just on hand or a steady flow of products coming in hand. And I'm just simply, again, finding suitors for what they have um, and taking kind of like a top end commission off of those. Um, something in the past, actually, one of my connections I've made in, in Vegas was an import connection, right? So it's it's bringing in containers from Europe from a, a huge distribution company that is is buying from the manufacturer of you know PNG and a lot of these big European beauty brands, 
bringing in the container and then aggregating those orders as as see fit, right? So it's taking a supply chain that's really, you know, typically anywhere between like four, five, six, eight iterations of manufacturer, distribution company, distribution company, distribution company, you know what I'm saying? All the way down to like ultimately a domestic distributor and the Amazon seller. And it's importer me or manufacturer me, Amazon seller, right? So it's allowing the, the supply chain to really get consolidated because if you notice, there's not many importers in the Amazon space, right? Twitter, Instagram, there's not really many importers that are like in tune with what the Amazon seller wants, in tune with their margins, in tune with sorts of the product that they're wanting, right? There's so many iterations between that, that, that kind of gets convoluted over the, over the different, all the hands in the pot. So that's one of the big goals in terms of like, knowing the amazon space obviously having a ton of good friends and connections in the amazon space wanting to fulfill their wants and needs um and could just kind of using my knowledge of both ends to kind of bridge that gap um and again put a lot more money inside of the amazon seller's pocket because there's just typically so many tiers so, so, so many hands in the pot so many iterations that go from a product starting in europe and ultimately ending in the amazon seller's warehouse mm. Very interesting. That is very cool to listen to. And because I know that's very new and a lot of wholesalers just don't do that. Um, Cause you, again, there's just not a lot of those importers in the space. That is really cool. Well, the other thing is, right. And so everyone wants like the best pricing, right. Mm -hmm. But as an Amazon seller, the other thing is, right. What is the biggest populace in the Amazon community? Right. The biggest populace is people who have bought into the model, maybe have had some experience, had some success with OA that are looking to get into wholesale. Right. right. They don't that, know how to make the transition or they're scared to make the transition. They're scared to pick up the phone to call. That's going to be the most prevalent Amazon seller. People who have maybe are in the first six months, three months, four months, know and have a lot of success with OA, right? Because of all the good content that's out there. We know a bunch of good content creators want to make that next step into wholesale, but either don't have the connections, don't want to make the 500, 700, 1,000 calls, but and want that sort of good wholesale pricing. And so for me, the distribution model is sort of like that crutch to get the experienced, confident OA seller that wants some of the piece of the pie of the wholesale space, gives them an opportunity to have that piece of the pie, again, without having to rely on all the different iterations. It's the imported prices, but now because we're aggregating across a couple different sellers, well, now everyone gets a benefit from those imported prices at a consolidated supply chain without having to worry about all the other people that come before them, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah, and that's huge. Just way better pricing in the end. That's so good. Now, have you been limited in capital during these like business ventures? Was it all like self-funded? Did you do loans? Did you do, how did you raise capital? So a lot of it from the beginning was um, just self-funded. Obviously I was, I was working nine to five. I had saved up a good bit. Um, I did take out a loan, just like a private. So this was probably, honestly, but probably even before Amazon lending even came into existence or I hadn't qualified for that yet. So this is two, three years ago. I had taken out like a small, like a private business loan from, I forget what the name of the company was, but it was only like $20,000. But at the time it was, it was, it was substantial. I could move the needle quite a bit. So that kind of bridged the gap of like, you know, the credit card statements that made a big yeah. dent. And that was really the kind of like the added leeway, the added runway that I needed at the time to kind of catapult the rest of the snowball into fact. Because I actually, it, was, it took a while to actually ever, you know, start taking money from the business. So, um, and I, again, for the people listening to this, I advise you to do the same, right? Keep that money in the business, keep that snowball growing as, as much as possible, right? Because if you're operating at, call it a 12, 15% margin, which is probably pretty standard, and you're taking your cut, well, that 12% margin now turns into two or three after taxes. And your snowball is now rolling down like a flat. You're not rolling down a hill. It's like a little, you know, a yard. You know what I'm saying? It's, it just grows a lot slower. And the biggest, the biggest lever you have, the biggest gasoline on the fire is going to be more capital, right? There's only going to, and we talked about this before, right? There's only going to be two problems in this business, products or capital. Products yep. are easy to solve, right? All the content that's available, the YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, all the content. There's a bunch of small, smart people in the space, right? So the product issue shouldn't be a very prolonged issue. We could solve that. The capital piece is a little bit more complex, a little bit takes a little bit more creativity, right? That's where, of course, for me back in the day, I resorted to the loan. But um, that's the piece that can take a business, catapult it, or hold it back, right? Because you could have all the products in the world, but if you only have a thousand dollars to spend every month, 
those really, really good products, you're still going to be restrained. You're going to have, you know what I'm saying? You're going to be on a leash. But the cool thing is, and that we see this now, nowadays, modern day, is when you combine for the newer seller product information as well as capital, well, that's where we see the $20,000 or the $5,000 a month, the 30, and then the 110. Yeah. Right. Because the, the best thing about this business is that the ceiling is really as high as your capital can take you. Right. Yep, There's no restriction. Yep. The data doesn't change. Right. If I compare a five hundred dollar business and a fifty thousand dollar business, a five hundred thousand dollar business and a fifty thousand dollar, it's not really any different. The main difference is going to be just how much money are you putting out for the same type of product. Right. The data doesn't change. Your market spend doesn't change. You don't need to require more people. You don't need to require more marketing budget or customers. All the customers are there. If you understand products, if you have a data fluency aspect and you know what's good, add more capital to that, you're going to see success. And that's probably the big, biggest thing. Forget the question. I kind of went on my own tangent, but yeah. No, that was perfect. It's basically what capital you use and you answered that question perfectly and why capital is so important in your Amazon business. And, you know, it is basically the almost the number one limiter that you could probably have besides just learning that's yeah. going to cost you. Now, um, are you are you a one man show right now, or did you start off that way and then transition? What is what does your team look like? Man, it's it's a it's a family operation now, which is pretty cool, right? So, um, a lot of you guys who have who have uh, who are listening to this probably met my fiance who helps out a bunch. She lives obviously lives with me, so just she handles some of the pickups if they're local, some of the prep in house. Um, my brother has joined the business. He came on probably pretty shortly after I started, probably a, maybe a year after. Um, he kind of saw me build it up. He joined in, uh, he has a wife who also helps. So we have a bunch of just in-house family help that, that, uh, kind of keeps the fire going, keeps it building. And, uh, that's, it's really, yeah, have a couple of VAs here and there, but nothing too per substantial. It's pretty much all in-house. Do you have a warehouse as well? You said in-house pickups and prep. Uh, so we did, um, did not renew that lease. It was, it was not a lot of people also know that story too. It was not a very successful warehouse experience. I uh, ended up living in that warehouse for most of the time there, which was not fun. Do not advise it. Um, but just from like, uh, we have a couple of suppliers that are in New Jersey. And, and so Alyssa does some pickups down there. She works close to there. So she picks them up, preps them here, and then we kind of ship them out whenever, whenever the need is. But yeah, um, we have a couple, we have a warehouse partner, a prep center in Massachusetts that we use for anything that we can. Um, and then of course, from the distribution piece, we have different third party prep partners that, um, kind of all over the country that wherever products come in, they kind of help us out there. Got it. Okay. How, how many different three PLs do you think you work with just as a curious question? Um, so right now only two. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We have, I mean, again, that that's the easy part, right? If we need somewhere in Oregon, we can get that in a couple of days. That's not an issue, but right now, Massachusetts right. and uh what a max cat he has one in pennsylvania that we use sometimes too okay gotcha that's it okay so when you were first transitioning from oa to wholesale so first question is what did your outreach look like and then what was the size of your first po oh man it's a good question in terms of the size, I actually, and this is embarrassing to admit, I don't remember what the first one was, which I definitely should remember, uh, but I don't. Um, but answering the other question, at first, um, I just did kind of like the standard Google approach. Philadelphia grocery wholesale, Philadelphia grocery vendor, you know, just like what a lot of people say to do in terms of just reaching out to distribution companies. Uh, but for me, again, similar to how I approached OA, I was looking for a more efficient way, a more and more higher converting way to find suppliers, right? And for me, that came with a more brand direct approach, right? Because the problem is, and the problem as I see it is, the distribution approach is, is great, right? You find a ton of companies, you open up a ton of accounts, right? But similar to manual sourcing, I think of Google distribution, the method is, is kind of the same way, right? Because I can open a hundred different accounts, do the outreach for a hundred different distribution accounts, and what, what am I left with, right? There's gonna be really three types of products inside that distribution account. Products that are on Amazon that sell well, products that are not on Amazon that sell well, and then products that are on Amazon that don't sell well, right? So you're gonna have like three different categories, of products, three different quality of products. And the, the, the impediment, the problem as I see it with the distribution approach is it's hard to qualify up front, right? If I'm reaching out to a distribution company, it's hard to tell where they lie in the supply chain. 
It's hard to tell maybe even the sorts of brands that they have. It's hard to sell, tell what sorts of products within those brands that they have. And it's just kind of generally convoluted in terms of like how to qualify one distribution company from the other towards the other, chose the other, chose the other. But the problem is you have to put in the work to get all of them, right? You have to make the call. You have to make the follow-ups to get every single one of those accounts open. And again, I would rather, similar to reverse sourcing, just a more qualified approach, hence an enter like the brand direct approach, right? Because I know when I reach out to a brand, I can qualify based on all the criteria that I want. I can qualify based on the number of sellers on the listings. I can qualify based on the size of the brand, based on the velocity sales rank, based on maybe stability of certain SKUs. I can qualify based on all those sorts of things, again, starting with the data side starting with the product basis, I can make a lot of informed decisions based on, okay, I wanna reach out to this brand as opposed to this brand, this brand over this brand, right? Because I know the brand's not on it. I know Amazon's not on it. I know there's, you know, four or five, six sellers. That's so why I know people are arbitraging it. And I know all these sorts of things, velocity, all these things, right? And so when I go to the brand, I already know that the problem piece, the product piece is solved. I qualified based on the piece that's on, that cannot be changed. Right? I qualified based on the velocity piece, which is the only sedentary piece of the product equation. I can worry about price later. That's malleable. Right? So when I'm approaching these brands, I have that assurance that, okay, a lot of the hard work is done. A lot of the qualification is done. So I, when I do, if I do get this account, why well, I know the only piece that's left is, again, the only malleable piece, price, whether it's bigger orders, whether it's uh, I'll, take the, I'll take maybe a 5% margin here in hopes I'm going to get 10, 15, 20% down the line. Right? I can alter and adjust that pricing piece based on negotiation or bigger pricing or just more of a longstanding relationship. Right? And the other cool thing about it is even if I don't win that brand account, which happens a bunch, well, what's the follow-up? Hey, understand the time is not great. There's a lot of Amazon sellers that are qualified for a brand like yours. I get it. Right? We completely respect your decision. That's cool. The only thing I ask is, do you have any distribution companies that you work with that you can refer us to because we want to represent your brand, because your brand fits a lot of the criteria that we're looking for? Can you put us in contact with a sales rep of one of your authorized distribution companies so we can reach out to them and said, knowing that yours is not a good fit for us? Well, what did I do, right? I still am going to getting that distribution account, but I went in like a backdoor approach because I've qualified all those sorts of things and I got a referral right from the brand, right? So it's accomplishing kind of like accomplishing it from both sides right ideally we get the brand account but if we don't get that well ideally well ho hopefully then we can you know get a distribution count that was now referred to by the brand we know the product is good we know the brand is good again what's left is that price piece and again obviously the biggest failure is you get to know by the brand they don't have anyone they can connect to but that's the name of the game right and so that's kind of how in the beginning of my wholesale journey how we approached it is knowing that I wanted a more qualified approach, similar to how we source away, I wanted to apply the same sort of reasoning, same sort of methodology, same sort of tactics to the wholesale model. And it worked pretty well because that's how we built it over the year. Got it. So focus a lot more on reaching out directly to brands versus distribution. Yeah, I probably should have said that instead of my long monologue, but here we are. <laughs> I mean, that also like helps you with, you know, understanding like where the products are even coming from and make sure that, yes. you know, the distributor is actually legit and is offering, you know, those products and not some sort of knockoff, which is absolutely huge for, you know, your health account and all that kind of stuff. Big too, time. Which is, but, yeah, oh, yeah, big time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, the, the flip side of the, the PO question that I ask you, what's the largest purchase order you've placed to date? You know, funny enough, it is not what you would expect. It was 93000 for a product that the brand was actually on the listing, right? And I tell us, oh. I tweet about it a couple of times a month, a oh. couple of times every couple of months because it just develops a bunch of engagement. But yeah, the brand was actually on the listing, completely cool with it, but the purchase was from the brand. Um, and again, a lot of people don't know this, right? There's a lot of upside from, from a brand's perspective to sell on Amazon, but not uh hold the entire piece of the pie mm. right because now you have sellers that are putting out ppc dollars that don't come from their pocket right mm -hmm. now you have a bunch of sellers that worry about the supply chain now you don't have to now you have a bunch of sellers and you sort of have that sort of extra cash flow right you have the added margin that amazon provides but you're also getting from four or five six different other sellers cash up front to continue to you know pay the bills in the meantime right so a lot of brands even small medium-sized brands sell on Amazon, but you'll see it a bunch. They don't own the entire listing, right? 
they may own 15, 20, 30%, but they don't want full responsibility because now they have to worry about the listing. Now they have to worry about PPC. Now they're paying all these sorts of dollars. Now they have to worry about and be a professional on Amazon instead of being a professional in the manufacturer space. Now, instead of being a professional in the distribution space or supply chain space, right? So I've seen that a lot in terms of like, brands operating in Amazon, but not necessarily monopolizing Amazon. And so that's a big opportunity for people to come in. And again, it's easily identifiable, right? You see a brand that's maybe owning 20 or 30%, 15% of a listing, but you also see five, six, seven other sellers that aren't getting kicked off. Now, what does that tell you? That should be a light bulb moment. Oh, I should reach out to this brand because I know they're operating with six sellers. Maybe I can be the seventh because I can provide an extra value piece. Maybe I'm providing, I want to pay for PPC then. I see that the other sellers are not pay, paying for PPC or maybe the title or maybe any number of things that you can add as from a value perspective, that should be a light bulb moment if you ever sort of see that sort of listing. So was that a conversation where you became an authorized seller for that brand or did they not know that you were selling on Amazon? No, they did. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that's okay. the only reason why. Yep. Um, they allowed it. I mean, they they 100% knew it was going on Amazon. But it's for the all, all these the reasons that I meant that I mentioned, right? Steady stock. I, of course, I was paying for PPC. It didn't come out of their pocket. It's a lot of benefits for them to do so. Right. I just wanted to clarify that. For the yeah. Lawyer. And then was the PPC part of the purchasing agreement, or did you just do that just because it was going to boost your sales? It was just like an understanding that we would be expected to run that sort of thing. Okay. Um, it, it wasn't necessarily in so any sort of like contractual agreement, but it doesn't necessarily need to because what they have all right. the leverage. Like, oh, we're not yeah, selling yeah. to you anymore. We didn't see right. run PPC. Oh shoot, my bad. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> now, were you worried about like buy box share with the brand being on? Like, were you worried about like not being able to like generate any sales unless it, you know it was coming from like ad? Yeah. So there was actually a lesson learned, right? Because th so that didn't necessarily pan out as good as I expected for the main reason that it was mapped. And this uh, is another takeaway for all the listeners, right? Something that you always, always, always have to be mindful of in a mapped scenario is what sorts of other sellers are on the listing and garnering what sorts of percentages, right? Because the size of seller, the size of your review count isn't necessarily as crucial because again, we have competitive advantage with pricing, right? That's our edge to get extra buy share, get extra sales, those sorts of things. But in a mapped scenario, there is no competitive advantage earned or available at all. Right, So it's just sitting in line, waiting for sales as they come in. And a lot of times from what I've seen in a map scenario, it just comes with like stability and longevity on listing, right? Amazon just like rewards people who have been in stock longer. So you really have to like sort of like penetrate that supply chain and then you have no control over it. Right. So in that case scenario, I definitely would not have bought again. I didn't rebuy again just because like the sales came so, so few and far between um, because it was mapped. There was already five, six sellers that had, you know, five figures, four figures of reviews. Um, it didn't necessarily pan out as, as well as I would hoped, but it wasn't for anything other than just slow sales based on, you know, the, the map scenario and just the bigger sellers. Interesting. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Kaja, do we want to transition to like socials? Yeah, definitely. So okay. you, yeah, you, you have a question? I was going to say, I think a lot of people, and I know especially myself, want to know, you know, how the Buy Box podcast got started. One, how long it took for it to where you were like, oh, this could actually, you know, be something really cool. I think those two questions were would be pretty cool to answer. It came pretty quick. And so again, we started at Miles, myself, Danny, and Dan is just like a, an operator, right? So we're, it was one time on Zoom. I don't remember where or how we came up with the name. The buy box. I think, I think Danny's always going to go down and say he was responsible for it, but I don't actually necessarily know if that's accurate. But anyways, we talked about doing the podcast. We thought it'd be cool. Um, and leave it to Dan. He had $700 mics ordered the next day. He had all these mic stands and like thousands of dollars in equipment ordered to my house in like three days. Um, and so Miles and Danny both drove to my house. And if you go back, the first two episodes were actually yeah, recorded yeah. in my living room at the time. That's funny. Um, and it's cool because you could see as the episodes progressed, we did like three in one day. 
And as you go through the the the, the sessions, the episodes, you could see the sun going down in the background. <laughs> we started the first episode, it was light out. The third, it was pitch black. We had the lights on and everything. So yeah, we recorded the first three in my living room. And I think the next two actually in the warehouse at the time, you could see like the backdrop of all the shoes and stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, the idea where it's something we thought, you know, it would be cool because at the time, again, there wasn't nearly as many podcasts. Um, we all, we, we all knew we were, you know, planning on taking this social media thing pretty seriously. Of course, having miles be like the spokes spokesperson of social media. Um, so we knew we wanted to take it pretty seriously. We knew it was a long game. So we were like, there's no better way to kind of continue to get exposure, continue to put our, um, put our names out there than with a podcast. And, and that was kind of the, uh, the beginning of it. And we've kept it going in spurts all of this since. Really how cool. many episodes do you have total now? Uh, I think it's 162, 150 something. Yeah, Miles, I think, knows the number, but I think it's like 163 to something, somewhere in that range. That's crazy. That's really cool. And when when was the first, what year was the first episode? Was that 21? 22? 22, I believe. 22, yeah, so. I believe, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. How did you how did you go get you guys have like a lot of like cool guests on your, you know, podcast and all like how did you get them? Like what kind of outreach did you do to see if you can land some of these like really big sellers? It's cool. And it's kind of it has transitioned over the, the past couple of years because in the beginning, it was a little bit more challenging to get people right because you know, we're new. We were newer. Our audiences weren't nearly as big. We didn't have as much notoriety. Um, and so there's a lot of outbound outreach, you know, can you want to come on this podcast? Yada, yada, yada. Um, but again, it's kind of transitioned to a lot of inbound now, right? We get tons of people that want to come on want to be interviewed, want to just chop it up and kind of, you know, just hang out on the podcast. But in the beginning, it was definitely a slow start. Um, obviously we, we saved a lot of the bigger names for, for down the line, knowing that we would still be going. So the first 50, if you go back, you'd probably um probably wouldn't see any like the, the massive massive sales and i hope i don't offend anyone by saying the, the first 50 but uh, where whereabouts but then you know but some see, of those first 50 now they're the big guys they might no, not yeah, yeah. Then like, now they're big players of course we all know like the amazon lits of the world the um the larry's like the scott yep. needham's those probably came closer to, like you know 100 plus 75 plus i would assume probably in that range just because we wanted to kind of establish ourselves and just, you know, keep it going. But for us, it was never really just like, um, it was just mainly like a, a, like a fun natured thing for a very, very, very long time. Yeah. hundred percent. That's so cool. What, what was like, maybe like the, the best, like full circle moment or like a moment that you realized like on the podcast where it's like, we're doing this like this is actually really like this is incredible yeah the probably the, the coolest part was when we had mike mccallowitz on because mm -hmm. that was someone who in the beginning i listened to all their all his books he's like a new york bestseller like he was a pretty cool dude a pretty notable dude right um and if you i don't know i think this is even before your guys time like i was always talking about profit first and like his sort of books like way back when um so at the so i I forget. I think I reached out to like his assistant or something to see if they would be interested. They replied like within hours, like, heck yeah, let's do it. We scheduled it. Of course, knowing him, we had to schedule it like four months in advance. <laughs> um, and then obviously the, the time came and he was on the screen. I was like, holy moly, like this is actually like we're, we're doing something pretty cool. Um, that as well as, um, I mean, just kind of getting like, so like I've had, you know, people recognizing me in like the Philly airport leaving um uh, for like whatever conferences or whatever so it's just that sort of like exposure be like people listening to the buy box bandits um but it just never gets old right people saying oh i've listened to every episode or you know come when it's year end like january february when like spotify releases like all their stats yeah and people post them on twitter people are like tens of hours or thousands of hours a year listening to the, the podcast like that sort of stuff is just wild yeah it's incredible yeah it's incredible. I, mean, I remember when we were first getting started i i definitely listened to at least the first 50 and just binge them in a couple of weeks yeah just soaked up so much information yeah was, kaja would send me one like every other day like dude you gotta listen to this one dude you gotta listen to this one <laughs> and i like had like an hour ride home so i was able to like churn through them like i was listening at least once every day on my way home and being like dude this makes so much sense we yep. gotta do this <laughs> It's kind of wild though, looking back, because like I mean, you could see it in front of like well, I mean, Miles and I just kind of like have grown up over the years, right? You can see like him, like his hair goes short, long, short, long, <laughs> to mullet to not mullet, right? And it's like 
you could actually like legitimately, as I look back on those sorts of episodes, like I can see myself like aging in front of like everyone's, everyone's eyes, which is kind of weird to think about. Yeah, yeah. totally weird to think about. Absolutely. All right. Ready to wrap it up? Sure. Well, guys, we appreciate you listening. Thank you, All Out Amazon, a.k.a. Garrett, for spending time with us today. His socials will be linked below. Any last words, Garrett? Man, for the people that I met over the weekend, it was awesome, obviously, getting a chance. For the people that I beat in Cornhole, I do apologize. I had to do it to you. Oh, we had an epic battle, though. We were not one of those people. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it was just all a good time from Vegas to Miami, getting a chance to kind of recharge that social battery a bit. But um, yeah, man, ready to keep killing. Everyone keep winning out there. And we'll uh, let me know if you need anything in the meantime. Absolutely. All right, everyone. We will see you on the next one.